Hello, this is Daniel Raymond, the voice behind Ray's Guide, and this is the sixth video in a series explaining server meshing from the player's experience. In the first video, I explained client-side object container streaming, server-side object container streaming, and discussed that the two main problems with the current system, that is absolute dispersal, which is mostly a server problem, and absolute concentration, which is mostly a client problem. And both are the reason behind the 50-player server cap, the thing that we're all trying to get beyond. In the second video, I discuss shards, their history, what they do, the issues and persistence that they cause, and why we want as few of them as possible, but still not be saddling two-thirds of the world with a disadvantage from being too far away from the data center. My estimate is that the equilibrium between these two concerns will be three to five shards, each serving continent-sized regions. But to start with, we may have almost as many shards as we currently have servers. One of the main challenges in getting from having too many shards to having just a handful will be getting the necessary performance out of the subject of the third video, the replication layer, which has the task of keeping everybody cross-informed of what everyone else is doing and doing what we're seeing in the game world around them, and essentially acting as both your computers and the game server's source of what I liken to a big book of game information, which is actually called the Entity Graph Database, and that was the subject of the fourth video, which then in the fifth video allowed us to finally discuss the servers that will actually be meshed with server meshing, which is the dedicated game servers, or DGS, although I prefer to call them the distributed game servers. Now in this last video, I'm going to talk about something that in their presentation and the Q&A, the network team intentionally avoided going into in detail on, and that was because it was outside of their area of responsibility. And that is how server meshing will change the design of the game itself. And it really isn't server meshing that will be driving the changes, but the increased player count on shards. Because it may not be obvious, but there are a lot of things about the current design of Star Citizen that have evolved presuming a 50-character server limit. And that will require a rethinking of both what the game design is trying to accomplish and how it's accomplishing it. And those changes will fall essentially into two categories, increasing capacity and encouraging dispersion. In the pre-server meshing star citizen, dispersion is a problem, but server meshing handles dispersion so well that it now becomes desirable because its polar opposite, player concentration, isn't solved so well by server meshing because it is mostly a client problem. Because if we are going to get to three regional mega shards, we're going to need to be thinking of shards containing 10,000 players or more. So let's look at a simple example each of increasing capacity and encouraging dispersal. So at Lorville, are there enough hangars at Teasa Spaceport to serve a 10,000 player shard? Even presuming that by then there will be even more star systems, the answer is clearly no. There needs to be more hangars, either by putting more into the current boundaries of the spaceport or by building an annex outside of town. All the current spaceports and stations will likely need to be redesigned with additional hangar capacity. As our second example, let's take the transfers office at the Lorville CBD. Is this room big enough to serve a 10,000 player shard? Again, of course not. But the answer isn't to make this room 10 times or 100 times larger. That would just overwhelm your client with having to draw so many people in one huge room. It is to not require everyone come here to trade. Put trade terminals in more places, perhaps even just one in each hangar. Or make a MobiGlass app for connecting to the local TDD. That is encouraging dispersal. Many systems will require both approaches. For example, to serve a 10,000 player shard, there will need to be a lot more mining outposts. But then, how do you ensure that the players spread themselves around all of them? You can't do it with just a system where they go someplace and then find out if there is supply and at what price. You need something like what I've been describing as the offer acceptance model. You need to create a system where you see ahead of time what outposts have so much and at what price. And then you buy ahead of time. And when you get to the outpost, they can just direct you to the containers where your goods are and you load them up. Similarly, you can view offers to buy the same goods, accept the contract to deliver them, and then you just have to go there to unload. You can then spread the players around the trading game by just spreading around the offers and buy and the offers to sell goods. But players, being both social and mischievous, are going to try to cram a thousand players into a room just to see what will happen. And they will try to create a thousand ship space battle for the same reason. And what they will find out is that their systems will run at slow frame rates. Not because the server is overwhelmed, but because their own systems are overwhelmed. Sure, the server can share them among more than one DGS, 
although the benefits begin to diminish, but your client still has to render all of those other ships. And when the slow frame rates happen, players will point to three things. First, they will complain that why can't we have big ship battles like their favorite Star Wars, Star Trek, or whatever movies. And the reason is that those movies are rendered on massive server farms at a pace measured in seconds per frame and not frames per second. So it is simply not a relevant comparison. Second, they will complain that for some other space games, they can have bigger space battles. And of course they are. There will always be games having larger space battles than Star Citizen. I know you don't want to hear that, but telling people what they don't want to hear is becoming something of a motto for this channel. Because if you have a game when in space mode, your character is a 50-face irregular polyhedron moving in a 3D environment shooting at other 50-face polyhedron, you're right. You can have a lot of them going on at once with current hardware. But if instead you have your goal designing a game where there is no space mode and your character is a fully realized human of many hundreds of polyhedra and your crewmates who are also fully realized human characters in a fully detailed ship interior where you can get up and move around and do damage control and put out fires and then exit the door, float across through the other ship, blow the hatch on it, and then board it and engage in a firefight with the occupants of the other ship, you have to allocate the graphic and computational resources very differently. All the resources that you have to dedicate to those fully realized characters and fully realized ship interiors could have gone to making more 50 polygon ships out there. But that's the trade-off. And that's the choice the CIG has to make. They can either educate users about what will happen if they bring too many ships together in a battle and then create gameplay that won't require that the players have to bring lots of ship together. Or they can just keep the player shard count low enough that frame rates on mediocre hardware will still be good even if every player on the shard brings their ship to a single battlefield. In which case, expect player shard limits to never get very large. Which brings up the third thing players will complain about, and that is that why have larger shard player limits if they can't do things together? Which is the challenge that CIG will need to redirect their game design goals towards. How to have players work towards common victories without being in the same place. The easiest way to illustrate is with examples. So, first example. How would you rework Xenothreat for a thousand players? Well, you would start by having several well-spread-out areas where the shipwrecks would be, separated by enough distance that they could definitely be on different mesh servers, and then distribute the player's assignments to missions so that each of the locations has roughly equal number of players. Second, how would you rework Ninetales Lockdown for a thousand players? Well, you would have several places be under lockdown rather than just one, and different players assigned to help or break the blockade at each one, so they were distributed. You would then have more than one commodity so that one player might be asked to bring medical supplies, another processed food, and another hydrogen, and so forth. And third, how would you change Jump Town for a thousand players? Well, obviously not by sending a thousand players to just one drug lab. Likely you will have several, with different players assigned to get the finished goods from each one, or perhaps make it multi-level, with some players also being needed to get scarce raw materials from limited locations to the drug labs, involving more players and in different activities in more places. So it really isn't hard to adapt things to larger player counts, so long as you change your mindset from dispersion being something to be avoided to something being sought. But some may say, well, what if I just want to have a plain old org war? My 500-player org versus your 500-player org and see who's the boss. Well, a good org war system needs to have one thing. A way to say who won. Which also implies a way to say when it's over. Because without a way to show who won, you will inevitably wind up with two orgs both claiming that they won and the other guys are liars. And this need for a way to say who won creates an opportunity to promote dispersion in a 500 versus 500 war. How? When the org war is declared, the two orgs must agree to how long it will last. The system will then create a set of markers based on the number of participants. Some of the markers will be in space, some on the ground, and still others in underground facilities. This makes the org war more interesting since your org can't just be a one-trick pony, but will have to win in many different environments. The war is scored by giving one point per minute 
to any org that is in sole presence of at least two-thirds of the locations. So while you may have a main assault force, you will likely have to break off many smaller forces to guard and hold each of the sites, maintaining dispersion. So a common victory, but dispersed engagements. That's the goal. And that is how increased player counts with server meshing will change the design of the game. Pretty much every location and activity will need to be redesigned either for more capacity, to increase dispersion of players, or both. Plus, it will mean setting expectations of players of how much to expect from their own computers if they bring too many ships to a single location. Because server meshing isn't a client technology. CIG may be able to help with client improvements such as Gen 12 and Vulcan, but it will always be possible to overwhelm your game client because of the complexity and fidelity of the ships and ship gameplay features of Star Citizen. Now for an update on the Grow the Channel ship giveaway. As of recording, we are half past the subscriber goal and just past a third of the member goal to release to some lucky player their choice, the Anvil Liberator, the ship shipping ship for shipping your ships, or the Misc Odyssey long duration exploration carrier. One entry per video, members are entered automatically, and if the winner is a member, as of the publication of the winning video, they win both the Liberator and the Odyssey. For non-members, just be a subscriber and comment somehow using the secret word. And the secret word for this video is what will the TSA spaceport be needing more of? Fly safe, keep it real, and I'll see you in the verse. This is Daniel Raymond for Ray's Guide.